Good morning. Um, thank you very much, Nola, for a very generous introduction. I don't recognise myself, but thank you very much anyway. Um, and thank you all very much for coming this morning. Uh, I'm sure, like me, there's probably a bit of you that would rather be out looking for spring flowers or nesting birds or whatever takes your fancy in the environment. So I do appreciate uh, your being here on one of the first truly kind of uh, stereotypical spring days we, we, we seem to have had. So um, I'm asking a question here in this presentation. Is restoration the best conservation strategy for the climate change century? If you're not familiar with restoration, you may wonder, is it even an appropriate strategy? Many people ask that question. So what I want to do is take you through a little the, the process of my writing the book and discovering the subject for myself and some of the issues that arise in it. And then I'm, I'm glad to say um, Jerry Clabby and, and Catherine Farrell will be responding and then we'll have a, a general discussion, which I always think is the real meat of these occasions. Um, I, I had, as Newell says, a background in writing about uh, the Basque country and the Basque conflict, the conflict between Basque nationalists and Spanish nationalists. And indeed, from my own political experience in Ireland, I'm sadly familiar with struggles between Trotskyists and Stalinists and various factions. And I was kind of weary, actually. I'd just turned 50. I'd published a, a book on the Basque country that happily went rather better than I expected it to. And I, I was looking for a new subject. And I've always had a, a, an entirely amateur interest in the environment and particularly in birds. I'm not a scientist. I can't even remember if I did science in the leaving certificate, but I suspect that I didn't. And um, somebody recently in, in, in a review described me as an upstart environmentalist. Well, if that means you started after 50, I'm, I'm very happy to accept that label. Uh, I think being an upstart is probably quite a good thing. Um, the first idea I had uh, was that maybe I could write a book about bird migration, but that I would look at bird migration not through the focus of science or ornithology, but that I would look at it through the focus of human culture. And so I would take birds that everybody's familiar with, depending on the country they live in, but say swallows, cranes, storks, eagles, and I would follow those migrations from north to south, east to west on occasion, I guess, um, but mainly north to south, and, and see what different traces these species left in everything from cave paintings, because swallows are represented in cave paintings by our ancestors, to 20th century, uh, 20th century popular music, swallows coming back to Capistrano, etc., etc. And it, it, was a, it wasn't a bad book to start a new life with, and that it enabled me to travel a lot and meet very interesting people. And I followed the Eurasian crane, which happily is turning up again occasionally in Ireland now, but following its main migration line from Spain, which I was obviously familiar with, to Sweden. Um, but I really wasn't getting anywhere with this book. It was becoming a kind of anthology of folklore, and I was unhappy with it. And meanwhile, I was invited by an American university, the University of Iowa, to their international writing program, mainly to talk about my Basque book, but I was there for three months, and I had carte blanche to do any research I liked, so I thought I'd talk to the Crane Foundation, which was nearby in Wisconsin. And during the, the course of this fellowship, I developed a, a friendship with Gregory Normanton, an English novelist, who was much more knowledgeable about the environment than I was, and who was deeply depressed about the state of the environment. And I have this image of every morning going into breakfast and Gregory pouring the coffee in the canteen and saying, you know, another chunk has fallen off Iceland, something terrible has happened. Every, every, every day, it seemed, there was something in the New York Times telling us that something terrible had happened. And I'm not, not for one instant saying that we shouldn't be taking those things seriously. But there was a sense of despair in the room when he talked about these things. And then one weekend, we had the extraordinary privilege of being guided by Peter Matheson. And if you haven't come across Peter Matheson's work, either as a natural history writer or as a novelist. I really recommend you, you look for him. Sadly, he died just, just a few days ago in his 90s. But he's a truly remarkable writer. He wrote a book called Birds of Heaven about cranes, which is how I 
I came to know him, the snow leopard, great white about the great white shark, many, many, many wonderful books. And Peter took us out on a, on a weekend seminar on prairie restoration. And Gregory and I were the two most environmentally conscious, if you like, of, 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 the, of the group on the fellowship. Um, but neither of us knew what restoration was. We, we simply, restoration was something that we thought applied to something you do to a house, to a guitar, to an ancient book, but something you could do to a landscape, something you could do to an ecosystem, it just didn't make sense to us. Um, the very first thing I guess we learned about restoration was how counterintuitive it often is. That one of the first things you need to do if you're restoring a prairie is that you've got to burn it. And again, and, and for many of you may say how, how terribly ignorant we were, but we really were that ignorant. We didn't understand that. But in fact, many people are that ignorant. So that when a landowner rings um, the, whoever it might be, the Fish and Wildlife Service in the US, for example, and says that he thinks he's found a bit of remnant prairie on his farm or on, on some land that he's just bought or she's just bought, um, and, and the first thing the Fish and Wildlife Service say is, well, you'd better burn it. Frequently, they think they're mad. You know, this is, this is sacrilege. You're, you're burning nature. But of course, burning is part of the natural ecosystem of a prairie or a savanna, first of all, initiated by lightning strikes before humanity spread across the planet as we have, and then very consciously used by Native Americans and many other peoples across the world as a way of managing for more savanna, more prairie, less forest. And this is just a photograph of Gregory, who you can barely see at night, uh, trying to burn a prairie, and because it was a, a wet night, it failed. So following that, I had a conversation with Gregory, and he put the heart across me because he said to me, um, you know, this restoration idea is really exciting because he said, until now, I thought we only had two options. One is to preserve, and preserve means you build a fence, you call it a national park, and you keep people apart from tourists and scientists, but essentially you keep active humanity out of it. And on the other side of the fence, you have development, which implies destruction, degradation, etc. And he said, but this is kind of something intermediate. And also our role here is really interesting because we're kind of, in a, in a positive way, we're actually managing the environment in order to enable it to recover. Gregory was thinking way ahead of where I was thinking. And then he came up with this idea. He said, he said, wouldn't it be great if there were other projects like this in different parts of the world? I mean, at this stage, as far as we knew, prairie restoration might be a, a nostalgic act by a few romantics in Iowa and Wisconsin, and that was it. We had no idea. And um, in, in, as Gregory said that, he said, he said, wouldn't this make a great book? And my heart kind of rose and sank in the same moment because I immediately thought, God, that's the book I want to write. But of course, I can't write it because it's Gregory's idea. However, I, I took him out for a few pints over several weeks and finally plucked up the courage to say to him, Gregory, are you going to write that book about restoration? And Gregory, who's the very left wing, very Cambridge, he said, he said my dear chap, he said, uh, that's nonfiction. I don't do nonfiction. And so I said, well, do you mind if I do? And he said, no, as long as you remember me in the preface. And I do remember him in the preface, and I mention him every time I talk about the book because it really was his idea. And to my great delight, I very soon found that I was actually spoiled for choice, that not only were there a few projects around the world in restoration, but there were projects everywhere. And here, perhaps, my ignorance really shows up. There were actually very active projects in Ireland on my doorstep in County Wicklow that I was completely unaware of. And, um, but the first project I got involved with uh, was this one, which again involved cranes. And it's actually, some of you may be familiar with it already. If you're not, I'd suggest you Google Operation Migration, because you really see some of the most extraordinary images I've ever seen in, in, in bird science, if you like. Uh, you might, might remember the movie Fly Away Home, which won an Oscar about 15, maybe 20 years ago, I think, about a, a, a microlite pilot who learned that geese followed the microlite, that if, if you know, his daughter brought home geese and they fledged and they began to follow the microlite. And he got this idea of 
What about the, the birds which are almost extinct and which need to be taught migration by their parents? Birds like cranes, birds like swans. And so with whooping cranes, they had this problem. There's only one naturally migratory flock of whooping cranes, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. There's only one migratory flock of whooping cranes left in the world. And how do you start another one? Because if you brought the adults from that flock somewhere else, they would simply migrate if they could find it. They would simply migrate back to their old route. How do you create a second flock? And they're doing it now with microlite planes, and it's an extraordinary experiment. And they bring the cranes uh, from Wisconsin to Florida in the autumn. And happily in the spring, the birds migrate back to Wisconsin of their own accord. There are a lot of problems with this project, but it is developing quite well. And, uh, and I did, uh, and I don't apologize for using the word, I did find something inspirational about this, that having virtually wiped out this magnificent bird across a continent, we were beginning to do something that might restore it to one of its old flyways. I then had to do a lot of kind of catching up on science, and I'm still doing it, and I went to various events. The Madison Arboretum is very important in restoration. It's one of the places where prairie restoration was first scientifically explored. And I also discovered the Society for Ecological Restoration, which is a worldwide body with members in Ireland, and very active members in Ireland, like Catherine Farrell. Um, and, uh, and it tries to bring people together from all over the world, though in my view it's still too North American orientated, um, to discuss the different problems that arise when you try to restore different ecosystems. And then I went to a seminar on restoring natural capital, which is a concept I'll come to later. All of these things kind of built up my knowledge of restoration. But then I had to go out into the field and find out what happens when you know, the rubber hits the road. Uh, does it work? And one of the projects that people had kept mentioning to me in the seminars and conferences I'd been at was a project called Working for Water in South Africa. And this caught my imagination, as it would probably catch the imagination of any Irish person of my generation, because the minister who launched this project in the first Nelson Mandela government was Kader Asmal, the former leader of the anti-apartheid movement, who, whom I, I had known here uh, in, the, in the 70s, 60s, 70s. And working for water is, a, I think, a really interesting model because it started as a purely ecological restoration project. Basically, South Africa has very, very few natural forests. The natural vegetation of South Africa, and particularly I'm talking about the Cape region, is fynbos. It's a, those shrubby plants that don't come much above your knees and um, incredibly biodiverse, really incredible variety of plants in this system. But in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, South African botanists began to realize that this ecosystem was disappearing quite fast. And it was disappearing because of alien invasive plants, predominantly Australian eucalypts and acacias, which were escaping from plantations and they were infesting, rather negative word to use, or they were, or they were prospering in South African watersheds and they were displacing the native vegetation. So they kind of realized that South Africa, during the state of emergency in a state of virtual civil war, um, was hardly going to be very taken by the issue of biodiversity on its own at that point. So they decided to see if they could find an economic factor that would tie in with a campaign that might help them restore these landscapes. And they came up with the idea, they kind of looked at the landscape and they said, well, these big trees must be consuming a lot more water than the small shrubs. Intuitively, it sounds, it sounds like they were probably right. Curiously enough, the real science is still open to question. Um, but they went to hydrologists and some hydrologists by their own, by their own, sorry about that, I don't know how that's happened. Um, um, 
some hydrologists um, said, yeah, yeah, this is probably right. If you, if you got rid of the alien invasive vegetation, you would actually be augmenting the South African water table. So they thought, great, I mean, water is critically important in South Africa, as everywhere else in the world, um, but particularly important in South Africa at a moment of political transition, when black people were quite reasonably demanding the same access to water uh, which white people had had. Hopefully that doesn't necessarily mean washing your car seven times a week or having three swimming pools, but certainly black people in the townships desperately needed water. There was going to be that demand, it was going to be met, so if you could go to government and say, we have a restoration program that's going to restore your water, well, then you had a stronger argument. And they went to Catarasmal with this argument after Mandela's election victory. And Catar, I think, very intelligently uh, said, we're not going to get this program through any ANC cabinet unless it has a strong poverty alleviation element to it. So he said, I want to do this program, but he said, let's do it as a public works program. Let's do it like the Citizen Conservation Corps uh, during the Depression in the US. Let's do it on a national scale, do it big, and employ the poorest of the poor to implement it. And there are all sorts of angles to this program that I, I could really talk about it for the rest of the session. Um, but it took off in a very big way. Uh, it got a very good press. And I was rather surprised when I got to South Africa to find that many of the people actually involved in it, including the senior executives, not Qatar, who, like most politicians, always thought that what he was doing was absolutely perfect, but many of the senior executives uh, really realized they had very serious problems. And I just leave you on, 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 on this particular issue with this note. If you want to do three things at once, they're all, I think, admirable. It's a good thing to res restore biodiversity. It's a good thing for the economy to restore natural capital in the form of water, and it's good, isn't it, to relieve poverty. But if you're trying to do three things at once, mightn't they come into conflict? Mightn't there be moments, for example, where if you do it as a national program, every local authority in the country is going to want a slice of it? And so it won't be ecologically focused. You may find that uh, the money is going to areas where the problem isn't really very acute, and therefore not enough money is going to areas where it is acute. Or to give you another example, if you're going to employ the poorest of the poor to do this program, people with no experience of the working world, people of no concept of arriving at nine in the morning and finishing at six or, or whatever, maybe it won't be done very well. Maybe they'll take out the wrong plants, whatever. All of these problems have arisen. The really refreshing thing about working for water, and I think it's absolutely exemplary in this respect, is that it knows these things. It knows about its problems. It knows about its challenges. It has commissioned two independent reviews in a 12-year period by outsiders which have made quite harsh criticisms of how they operate, and they have adapted their management accordingly. I'm not saying it's perfect now, and I'm not saying it's going to be perfect in 20 years, but it is getting better all the time. I next went to uh, Chicago, and Nula has already mentioned Chicago. Chicago is interesting, I think, because it's urban restoration, it's restoration within city parks, and it is enormously ambitious restoration group of citizen volunteers are actually attempting to restore prairie savanna more or less as it existed before white settlement in small disconnected patches of city parks. They're known as the forest preserves in Chicago. There are an awful lot of them. Some of them are quite big, though I don't believe any of them is more than half the size of the Phoenix Park. But it's a, it's a fascinating experiment. And the volunteers were operating from the 70s onwards, um, and they were kind of the typical 70s, coming out in literally in many cases, particularly in the case of their leader, a very charismatic man called Steve Packard, uh, coming out of the anti-Vietnam war movement, throwing all of that energy into an environmental project, and doing, I think, a very, very good job in all but one respect. And the vital respect, to my mind, and they still, they disagree with me viscerally on this issue. Uh, in all my political experience, I've never had disagreements 
like I've had with the people who run this project. They, they, they find any criticism, um, you know, you'd, you'd have done better in 1936 in Moscow in some ways than, than, than attempting to criticize these people in public. Um, uh, their huge failure was a failure to consult the neighbors. They were burning forests in people's backyards. Now, they were pretty good at it. There have been no serious accidents, though I think their practices are still open to question. But you do have to ask people. It's, it's not enough to just go around the back door and get the permission of the city authorities. Because what actually happened was, when the neighbors copped on to what was happening, there were massive protests against what they were doing. The city authorities, like most politicians, changed their minds in a flash and they put a moratorium on restoration in Chicago for 10 years with very negative results. So don't misunderstand me. I'm not against what they're trying to do here, but I am saying that in any restoration project, you have got to have a consensus with the community among whom you are working. It's not enough to be right, at least in a democracy, it's not enough to be right or to think you're right, because after all, we all may find out that tomorrow we were wrong. And, um, I think that is, you know, the, the, the takeaway lesson from Chicago. Cinque Terre is a place that some of you may know, may go on holidays, on walking holidays. It's a very beautiful area in uh, Liguria, in Italy. And what fascinated me about the Cinque Terre is that it is a national park. It's been restored as a national park. But it's been restored in order to recreate a cultural landscape, a very ancient landscape, at least a thousand years old, of terraced agriculture. And in order to do that, they're actually reversing what has happened over the last 60 years, which has been the spontaneous restoration of classic Mediterranean Maki vegetation. And the reason they're doing this is partly cultural, partly political, partly for, to attract tourists. After all, Maki vegetation is pretty common on the coast of Italy. But there are actually pretty good biodiversity reasons to do this as well, in small areas, and this is a, a pretty small area, because there are certain species, certain amphibians, for example, that are very rare and seem to thrive better in the cultural patchwork of the Cinque Terre landscape than they do if you simply allowed nature to come back. And I think what we're coming up against here, and I think one of the reasons that restoration is interesting and deeply challenging as a conservation strategy is that it forces us to think about what we mean by nature. Um, many of us grew up with, and American environmentalism was certainly born in the belief that there is kind of some kind of pristine wilderness out there. I grew up thinking that the, that the oak woods in Glendalough were ancient oak forests. Wasn't to look a bit more carefully at a postcard that my grandfather had sent my mother that I realized that most, most, most of those forests were actually bare uh, even in 1910. That the, 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 in the 19th century and earlier, much of Glendalough had actually been stripped. So very often what we think of as natural is actually regrowth from some form of human management. And if we're going to try to restore or conserve, we've got to take that into account. Um, Irish woodlands is, is a case in point. Um, if you simply took a, a pure conservation attitude to the tiny remnants of semi-ancient woodland that remain in Ireland, what would actually happen if you didn't manage them at all? If you said, you know, humans shouldn't be too deeply involved in nature, let nature take its course, well, I think everybody knows what would happen. They would become swamped in rhododendron and they would be extinct within a generation. So you've got to manage for alien invasive plants for starters, but it actually goes deeper than that because when you start to study these, I say, semi-ancient woodlands more carefully, you realize that they have been, and I know John Cross, who's here today from the MPWS, can certainly speak to this infinitely more knowledgeably than I could. Uh, we find that these woodlands have been managed in perpetuity in some way or other, that, that timber has been extracted from them, that trees have been coppiced and pollarded, etc. So there are all these questions then, what are we restoring to? Are we restoring to some ideal point in the past? If so, which point? And it gets more complicated. I went to a conference in San Jose of the American Society, the, Eco the Ecology Society of America, 
and the Society of Ecological Restoration combined. And there were all these climate change experiments taking place on, on Jasper Ridge and Stanford University. But the fundamental question that restorationists were beginning to ask themselves, and what I found as an outside observer fascinating, was that I was going to conferences and from one year to the next, I was seeing the agenda change as climate change became more and more evident in people's practice in the field. And so you have a, 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 an, an ecologist who's working on a cloud forest restoration project and rainforest restoration project in Monteverde in uh, Costa Rica. And she's bringing out, you know, bright-eyed young Americans to plant trees uh, to restore the, um, the rainforest and the cloud forest in Monteverde. And they're planting the right trees, they're doing a good job. She is no longer confident that they're planting them in the right places because she can actually see the gradations of the vegetation moving up towards the summit. And, you know, the problem here is terrifyingly obvious. If you have a mountain and you divide it into three grades of vegetation with A at the top, B in the middle, C at the bottom, and C starts to move into B, well, that's not too bad. You've still got the C vegetation. It's just moved somewhere else. And B starts to move into A as far as it can, but the landscape may not be, you know, there simply may not be enough soil for much of the, the vegetation in B. And then, of course, the big question, where on earth does A go? I mean, if, if we're talking about vegetation, where does A go? If we're talking about birds, maybe even animals, perhaps they can migrate. Perhaps, as some people are saying, we can assist their migration. People are actually talking, already doing, in the United States, translocating mammals from one point to another to be in more appropriate habitat. The, these questions are mind-bending. They, they, they make the kind of comfortable, romantic model of restoration obsolete. The world is changing so fast, if you like, we are degrading it so fast. And it seems faster all the time, recent headlines uh, make this obvious. Um, then, you know, restoration has to keep thinking on its feet all the time. It's constantly under challenge. Um, just want to mention a couple of other projects. Um, a wonderful project in southwest Australia called the Gondwana Link, linked to the ancient continent of, of, of Gondwana. And um, this man, Keith Bradby, is the, is the coordinator of it. And he's attempting to restore eight very distinct systems running from rainforest in the southwestern tip around Margaret River into the great western woodland uh, around Kalgoorlie, mining territory. And they're doing very interesting work there. And the really interesting thing I found about Keith is that uh, he started as a very radical environmentalist, again, kind of coming out of the left, out of the 60s, and, and always in confrontation. And then he began to live in the countryside. And <clears throat> it struck me as he put it, he said, you know, uh, if you're a green in the city, uh, you go and have cappuccinos with your green friends in, in, in nice cafes and you discuss the problems of the world. If you're a green in the countryside, well, you're not going to get a cappuccino. You're not going to get a cappuccino outside Calgary anyway. Um, you're going to be going to a local, you know, one-size-fits-all hardware store. And you're going to be doing your shopping alongside mine workers, alongside mine owners, alongside farmers. And you're going to be going to the bar with those guys and those women. And they're the people you have to talk to. They're the people you have to engage with, not the people who are already converted. And he's come up with some really interesting ideas, and he's got really good support, I think, for this project. But one question I'd ask, and you could ask it about most of the projects, but particularly large-scale ones like this, is it successful? You know, it's a bit like, uh, who was it? Somebody asked Mao Zedong or Chiang and Lai what they thought about the French Revolution. And Mao replied, it's far too early to say. And uh, I think with restoration projects, that is also the case, particularly under the, the pressures I've already been mentioning. Um, <clears throat> another extraordinary, <coughs> excuse me, extraordinary restoration project I encountered in Costa Rica is run by Dan Jansen. Dan Jansen and his partner, Winnie Halwax, are widely regarded as among the greatest biologists of the last half century. And they now choose to spend half their time living 
in dry tropical forest in Costa Rica. And what is really remarkable about Dan and Willie is the way in which, again, they have engaged with Costa Rican society. And Dan, Dan insists that, um, you know, more than anyone else I've ever spoken to, though he's a very pure scientist, he's in his 70s now, and his dream is to complete the taxonomic description of 14,000 species of moths and butterflies in the area in which he works. He's at about 2,000 at the moment. Um, but he's also an incredibly good political wheeler dealer. And he, he kind of works with all sorts of interest groups in Costa Rica from you know, hunters to fruit producers. And somehow he manages to keep most of them on his side and his work with the, what I found really refreshing about uh, the situation in Guanacaste where he works is that if, if you talk to some of the young Costa Rican rangers uh, working on restoration projects in the area, one couple in particular I was talking to, and, and they completely disagree with Janssen about how rainforests should be just restored. They disagree on the, the best sequence of, uh, of, of trees to plant and which trees should be planted. And you have the, you know, these people in their 20s who have only been to primary school and probably didn't finish primary school. And they are engaging in robust discussion with somebody with a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, who, as I say, would, would be on the top 10 list of biologists of, of, the, of the late 20th century. Um, and, and they sometimes win the arguments, and I found that very refreshing. And I found particularly refreshing the, 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 this little girl um, who, who was so eager to show me the, the, the range of, uh, of fish and animals uh, that, that lived in her bay. And these children are all the children of fishermen. And one of them explained to me how when she had gone home from a, a conservation class and her father, a fisherman, had told her that these conservationists were very evil because they were trying to stop him fishing. And she said, no, and it was an argument that went on for a month. And she said, no, no, she said, it's only if we preserve the mangroves and stop you fishing along the boundaries of the mangroves that the fish stocks will be preserved. If we're going to have fish in the future, we have got to have fish breeding now. And it was really extraordinary to hear 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds articulating these debates within their own communities. Um, by far, to, to me personally, the most challenging restoration project I encountered, or restoration projects, was in New Zealand. And um, New Zealand, again, was full of surprises to me. I knew nothing about New Zealand when I started writing this book, or practically nothing. I knew there were Maoris there, and I'm afraid that was about it. Um, what I hadn't realized was that, first of all, the Maoris only settled in New Zealand 800 years ago, roughly, white people arriving four or 500 years later. So that in some ways, parts of New Zealand are the most unmodified parts of the planet by humanity. But they've actually been modified very, very rapidly because the way New Zealand's ecosystems developed, they developed without mammals, the exception of three bats. And developing without mammals meant that the insects, the birds, the reptiles had no defenses, no knowledge of, mammal predators. So that when the Maoris introduce the rat and the pig, and when white people introduce a huge suite of mammals from domestic dogs and cats to deer to stoat, etc., and then possums from Australia, this is a rather decomposed possum, um, they caused absolute havoc in the ecosystems. And New Zealand becomes the extinction capital of the world in the 1960s. They lose three species in a single year. And public opinion in New Zealand, and I found this very interesting because apart from the Maoris, obviously, we could describe New Zealand as a broadly speaking Anglo-Saxon cult culture. And Anglo-Saxon cultures tend to be particularly protective of animals, at least at certain stages in their development. And so it was kind of really extraordinary to find. I mean, I don't know if you remember, there was a big controversy in Scotland I think about 10 years ago when some well-meaning idiot introduced hedgehogs to uh, one of the Western Islands in Scotland. 
and the hedgehogs proceeded to consume the ground nesting birds, exactly the same situation as was occurring on the grand scale in New Zealand. And the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds said we have got to eradicate the hedgehogs. And eradicate means kill, and that's, that's not put too, too fine a tooth in it. And um, there was there were so much protest in Britain about the idea of killing these hedgehogs that they all had to be translocated, which made the operation infinitely more expensive and therefore denied those funds to other conservation projects. And I think when you really think about it, this is just my personal point of view, and I'm sure people may disagree with me passionately about this, and they may well be right. Um, but it seems to me is, you know, why does the hedgehog have a right to life that somehow trumps the right to life, perhaps of a species, that where it's actually maybe threatening a species with extinction? And that's what was happening in New Zealand. So in New Zealand, restoration has basically involved the creation of mainland islands where they put a huge fence and then lines of traps, lines of poison around a mountain, and they eradicate all of the introduced mammals and they bring in the rare species and some of them are prospering again. But, but you're talking about tiny numbers and the success of many of these projects hangs on a knife edge. I, I think the Chatham Island Robin, I think there's only 57 of them left, but there were only five of them left when they started the project. So this is, the lesson I take away from this is not that it's good for animals, but this is how bad we've got. This is the kind of destruction we have wrought, that in order to give species a chance of avoiding extinction, we have got to do ugly and terrible things. That's a, a, very, it's a very harsh thought. As I say, I may be wrong. Traditional ecological knowledge was something I came across a lot within the restoration movement. And I have to say, I found it just a little bit too romantic for my taste. It was kind of, it seemed to me to be based on a kind of colonial guilt that perhaps being Irish, we don't really have to suffer from too much. And, that, and, and, and what I mean by colonial guilt in this sense is that the belief that because people have been treated badly, appallingly, subject to genocide, doesn't necessarily mean that they manage the environment any better than we did. And the Maoris in New Zealand, for example, were responsible for quite a number of extinctions. Why shouldn't they be? They belong to the same species. They do the kind of things we do. But I was aware that some indigenous peoples do seem to live in a much more sustainable relationship with nature. Some. And I think even within you know, the, the spectrum, if you grew up in the 60s, you'd have read books like Touch the Earth and bury my heart at wounded knee. And there would have been this idea that all Native Americans were you know, always going out and stroking robins. Well, actually they weren't. Uh, you know, they were driving herds of buffalo over a cliff, killing 10,000 buffalo to harvest 200. Not very sustainable. Um, but certainly some North American peoples did seem to achieve some sort of balance and maybe knew some things that we didn't know. And so I particularly went to look for a project that I thought would stand up culturally, sociologically, and scientifically, that this really would show that here was a people who were doing something that contemporary science couldn't have done. And I'm going to be running over time, so I'm going to, we can discuss this a bit more later, but this is a truly remarkable project where uh, a group of, a, it's a subset of the Mayan peoples uh, in Chiapas in Mexico, and where they, they have a system of farming uh, a very ancient system of farming, which is farming within the rainforest. And it, it's five-stage farming over a hundred-year period. And through this, if you like, very systematic following system, they actually steadily restore the rainforest which they farm. And I do think that this is a wonderful model. And they have introduced scientists, and here you have uh, the, the spiritual leader uh, and actually a great, a great botanist, on, on, on the left, um, yeah, Don, Don Manuel Castellanos, uh, on the left, teaching a, a white Mexican, uh, uh, Samuel Levi Thatcher, uh, about the species in the forest. There are species they're using which are still down to scientific names. Uh, so I was very happy to find a project that did show that there is a core of truth to that idea that some peoples have reached a sustainable balance with nature. Um, 
Finally, uh, on the Irish side, I came back to Boggs and I was, I was amazed to find the work uh, that a number of organisations in Ireland were doing, and Catherine from Bordemona will obviously be talking about this later. It's extremely hard. It's, again, ter it's terribly late as well. It was late for Bordemona. It's late for everybody. Um, but uh, there are projects that do appear to be bringing bogs back to life, bogs that have been badly degraded. And uh, that seems to me to be something that we should be doing a lot more extensively than we are already. Um, just want to take you through some core ideas in restoration, but I'm going to skip on a little. These are the kind of questions I think need to be asked. Why restore? Restoring to what? And restoring for whom? I think those three questions. The restore to what is the scientific question, if you like. Where, you know, what is the system to, towards which you are trying to aspire? And restore for whom? Who gets to say? And that's where the Chicago problem comes up, or the problem with turf cutters comes up. Uh, how do we deal with these questions in a democracy? Um, but I'd like to talk, finally, about some positives uh, out of restoration. Why do I think this is a good idea? I don't necessarily think it's the best strategy for the 20th, 21st century, um, but I do think it's a key strategy, and I think it's a strategy that needs to be used, and actually is being used much more widely. One of the things I like about it is that it's, it's, it's a paradigm for an interactive relationship with nature. Uh, it's not kind of sitting back, building a fence, and, and leaving things alone. It's recognizing that we're a species too, and we're interacting with other species. As Nuala said earlier, I think um, it's, it, it shows that we don't have to be the bad guys. We don't always have to be beating ourselves up, that we can have a positive relationship with nature. And I think engagement, engagement is the one word that comes back to me again and again and again when I think of restoration, is this sense of getting your hands dirty, going out and actually doing something. And I think that that has, or carries with it, a sense of empowerment. And one of the things that I found very worrying about the discourse from the environmental movement in my lifetime has been that it very often has seemed to be a message of despair. And that some people almost seem to be wedded to misery and that a divorce would be very painful for them. Uh, this is not to say that we are not enormously challenged. We are hugely challenged. But I think that restoration gives you an opportunity to go out and if you're able to see something, you know, even something as simple in your own garden as planting a native tree instead of an exotic tree, and seeing that native birds do better in your garden as a result, that is a tiny stage in a huge restoration cycle. If you can see that, then I think maybe you're, it kind of jizzes you up to be a bit more active in the world. Whereas I think constantly talking about how we're all going to be underwater in 50 years' time, constantly talking about it, don't misunderstand me for a moment, I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about it, or that we shouldn't be doing a huge amount more about it. But I am saying that it's good to be doing active things as well. <clears throat> There's also the purely scientific side, that restoration is teaching us more about ecology than almost every other approach to nature put together. Because simply, you know, as any mechanic knows with a car, the only way you get to know how a car works is if you try and put it together again. And that, you know, restoration is often teaching us things we didn't know but a particular insect or a particular micro, uh, microorganism has a function that we didn't understand previously and that we need to think about in conservation planning for the future. Um, I think also restoration links into the idea of restoration of natural capital, that in restoring our ecosystems, we are restoring the resources which give us, very obviously, resources like timber, like agricultural crops. It gives us fertile earth. It gives us clean air, clean water. It gives us slightly less obvious things like flood mitigation if you restore riparian woodland. And therefore, it's saving our society's money. We're able to actually go out into the political arena and say, we're not looking for more money 
here for conservation. We're saying that if you conserve, if you spend 10 euros on conservation today, you may actually save 100 euros tomorrow. And I think those kind of arguments are what, what an environment, environmentalist need to get political traction, which clearly, clearly we haven't got at the moment. Um, we can talk about this more later, uh, if you like. Um, I'd like to mention that there's a conference on this subject if you want to learn more about it in the Botanic Gardens at the end of the month, the 28th and the 29th. Uh, and what we're trying to do in this conference is actually to assist the public and the private sectors, including government, to actually meet the commitments that we're already, I mean, it's not had a lot of publicity, but we are already committed under EU legislation to value our natural capital, eco ecosystem goods, ecosystem services within uh, gross domestic product, etc. Um, but we're not doing it. We're supposed to do it by 2020, and it's, it's time we started. So we're hoping that this conference may, may play a part uh, in, in that process. Finally, I'm not saying that restoration is a magic bullet. There are all sorts of other things we need to do. We need to make radical changes in population control, in our economic and cultural paradigms. I just do not believe that market economics are sustainable. It just seems absolutely obvious to me. And no amount of restoration in the world uh, will save the planet unless we make some very big changes, including in our personal lives. And it may be that all restorationists are doing is rearranging blocks of semi-natural vegetation, real estate, on the decks of the planet Titanic. That may be the case if we don't make other changes. But does that mean we shouldn't try? Well, I don't think so. And I'd like to leave you with a message from Ed Wilson, who I had the privilege of spending some time with over the last couple of weeks in Mozambique, where he's involved in the restoration of an enormous national park after a terrible civil war. And he says, let us go beyond mere salvage to begin the restoration of natural environments. There can be no purpose more inspiriting, and it's interesting as an atheist scientist that he uses the phrase inspiriting, there can be no purpose more inspiriting than to begin the age of restoration, reweaving the wondrous diversity of life that still surrounds us. And I'd like to leave you with a couple of images of Ed Wilson and Gorongosa National Park, which I'm happy to say is with great difficulty and great pain, but coming back to life after being almost totally destroyed, as far as its big mammals were concerned anyway. Really extraordinary place. And involving the local communities in this restoration. And there you have Ed Wilson talking to one of the people who's training as an entomologist uh, in the restoration of Gorongosa. Thank you very much indeed.